Hello, beautiful people. Hi, folks. This is Dr. McGrory, and we are wrapping up our study of Word with our capstone, the Word capstone. This is an important newsflash that contains important information for your success. The capstone assignments have two parts, the greater and the quiz. You must make a 70% or above on the grader, or you will not be able to open the quiz. Once you pass the grader with 70% or above, then the quiz will display. So this is what it looks like, folks. I'm showing you with this important newsflash. You're going to go in, you're going to see the assignment that says Word Capstone Two-Part Assignments. When you click that, to open it, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to see this grader, and you're going to see the quiz, but you can't get into this quiz. I'm trying to click this to open it, and I cannot get into it. So what I have to do is I have to pass I have to have a status of past for this grader. It needs to be 70% or above to trigger this quiz to open. Then you can open that quiz. Then you can go in and earn those required points for the quiz. So what am I going to see at first? I'm going to see both parts of the assignment, but I, oops, I'm sorry, but I won't be able, let me close that, and I can download the assignment files for the grader. It works just like your regular chapter graders, but I cannot get to the second required part of this assignment until I have submitted and earned at least a 70%. Of course, you're going to go for that 100%. I know you are, and you're going to want to earn the 90% or above that I explained in the syllabus is what you have to earn in order to earn that badge from Pearson. So read the syllabus on this part, folks. Go straight to the part of the syllabus that says detailed explanation of assignments and turn specifically to where this part of the assignment is explained. So that's an important note for your success to help you with your very first capstone assignment. And this is for Word capstone, but this is the way that the Excel capstone and the PowerPoint capstone will work as well. We'll now resume your regular programming, <laughs> your regular video. Thanks, folks. And it covers chapters one through four. So you have your ebook, you can look things up, you have videos that you can watch, and you have my support through this video here. So let's get started because it is a capstone, and so we can expect that it's going to be a little bit longer. Let me go ahead and get out of this. And of course, I've downloaded my files, I've organized them into a folder. Here's the capstone. And, of course, I'm just going to briefly look at my files here. Looks like I have a theme. Looks like I have a picture. And I have two files here. And this one is the instruction file. So I'm going to open that. Briefly, let's just, you know, see what we've got, what we're dealing with. Well, we've got three pages, and we have 27 steps. That's not as many as I think it was Word greater th uh, three. So we're doing all right. We can do this. We do it one step at a time, no matter how many instructions there are. <clears throat> Let's just take a brief look here. It says, as you near graduation from college, you plan to apply to various graduate schools. You have prepared a draft of a statement of purpose that you will include in an application package to each university to which you apply. You modify the statement of purpose so that it is attractive and error-free. In addition, you include such items as a table, a picture, a header, a footer, a footnote, and formatting text in columns. Doesn't this sound like all the things that we've studied? But that's okay. This is your chance to apply those skills. Finally, you use mail merge to prepare personalized copies. You can do it, folks. We're going to do it together. We're going to start with Word. Step one, start Word, download, open the file name. You need to download that first. We're going to open, of course, the file that begins with our last name. So let's go ahead and do that. We've already downloaded. And of course, in my case, uh, it's called just called student. 
double click and I'm going to open that. First thing I need to always do, enable editing. And I, I do, I just want to kind of get the big picture here. What am I dealing with? It looks like a two page document and I, you know, really kind of one and a half, but I see two pages. Uh, there's my text looks very unformatted and this is very representative you may have to maybe you're a transfer student and you have to write something for a scholarship application or for you know if you're going to transfer to a university and you don't want to uh, get bogged down with formatting so you just write and now you're coming back to put all the the goodies in to make it look really good so let's look at our instructions step two apply the slice document theme. Select all the text in the document, change the font, change the font size, adjust the right and left margins. And they do give you a special note here that if for some reason you do not have this slice theme installed on your computer, it, it should be there by default. But if it's not, they have provided it for you and you can just add it. So they have that step here. Well, let me just switch over. And here's our document. And do you remember? Let's see if I remember. Across the top here, I think we're dealing with the design. And I'm going to look under themes. Remember, they are not in alphabetical order. Now, for me, I see that I have the slice theme installed. And that was by default. I didn't add it. I'm going to click that. I can already see some changes here. But isn't that interesting that it seems to only have affected some of the text? Isn't that kind of interesting? I am uh, curious about that. Um, I'll tell you, I, I, it, 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 I am curious about it. And so I'll tell you what I was just inspecting. And this is a tip that you're going to hear a lot more of as we next transition into Excel. Notice that I clicked in this text that looks different, but I wasn't looking at that because when I clicked there, this, you know, these ribbons, in addition to being able to use them to apply styles and formats, when I click there, it tells me what is already applied. So when I clicked here, I looked across the ribbon and I, I deliberately changed to this home ribbon and I noticed that this text is in this what they call normal style. It's usually the default style. So when I change the theme to the document, it updated these styles. And we saw that back when we studied uh, styles. In contrast, when I click down here, this is the first paragraph where there is no change. Again, I only look there for the moment that I'm clicking because what I want to view is really up here at the top, the settings. And do you see that normal is no longer selected? Uh, I'm not sure uh, that there is a style applied to this. So it did not pick up that theme. Okay, this is actually a good reason when we are working with a lot of documents, we do use styles and we try to use them very consistently because it makes it easy. We can change themes very quickly, you know, apply uh, modifications to those themes and it just uniformly uh, updates all those styles throughout the document. So it's really interesting to note that. Let's go back to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we probably haven't finished that, but let's look at those instructions again. So we applied the slice theme and we're going to continue. It says select, okay, and we're going to uh, update the fonts and stuff. So let's go back. Now, um, it did say that we're going to select all text. So how am I going to do that? Control A, selected all my text, and that we're going to change that to Bookman old style. So in my font, and I'm going to look for, and your fonts, your list of fonts may vary. And again, you can type this if you want here, you know, in that font box, Bookman old style. And we're going to set the size to 12 point. Adjust the right and left margins to 1.5. Um, okay, so I have two pages displayed right now. Let me zoom in so that I only see one page. I'm just going to make that little easier on myself and I'm going back up here to the top just as a point of reference. Now what I could do is I could come up to this top and do you see that when I put my mouse 
over the ruler and you know how to display the ruler when I put my mouse over that change from the active part of the ruler to the inactive part of the ru ruler to the margin my mouse changes shape and I could press excuse me I just lost oops select that again I just lost that but there we go I could press and drag to adjust that margin the same is true over here on the left side I can put my mouse over here and I can press and drag um, now I could certainly do that and I have a ruler here and they're telling me that this should be a, um, the both the right and left margin should be one and a half inches and I can try to use that ruler to to see if it's one and a half inches right Let me just go to about right there but I am kind of eyeballing it right so it's not going to be as accurate as if I use the dialog boxes and so I do want to do that so I'm going to go to layout and then I'm going to go to margin and there are some preset margins these do tend to uh, change the uh, these most frequently used is what I should say most frequently used margins so I'm going to go to custom margins and I'm changing the left and right and that's what I've been working with it looks like my top margin is at a half my bottom margin is at a half I need left to be 1.5 I'm gonna tab which puts me over at the right margin 1.5 do you see how handy it is to keep my hands on the keyboard rather than keep going to the mouse so this way I'm precise and I'm going to click OK so now I see that my entire document now has those margins well, hopefully my entire document what else do we need to do that is the end of step two so let's go back to our instructions scroll up here a little bit on to step three it says we're going to insert a header that includes a left aligned page number and that's it then we're going to close that header so let's go back to my document and did you catch me on this we did some good work and I did not save it I can't believe that let's save that good work let's save that now remember again we're talking a lot about rulers if I just, I'm gonna just click in my document so I don't have to have everything selected I'm just going to click in my document and in this top part you know this is where my ruler is inactive because I'm working in the body of my document and so the ruler is active for the you know highlighted it's in this white color for the body of my document but if I put my mouse in this grayed out area of the ruler and then I'm gonna go across because I need to be on the paper of, of the document and I'm gonna double click and that opens my header right love that shortcut use it all the time and they said to uh, apply a left aligned page number so in my header group notice my ribbon as soon as I opened that this part of my ruler became active and I got my header and footer ribbon and that's very important on this ribbon as I go across this is where I can find all kinds of settings I am interested in page numbers they did tell me that um, this is going to be in the header so it's at the top oops, excuse me at the top of the page and they want it left aligned so they didn't specify which of these page numbers but I'm gonna assume plain so I'm gonna click that what is the one thing you know you do not do do not type that page number I definitely want this to be a field which is what word just inserted see even as I select that as the number one is even a darker uh, grade shade showing me that's a field that's not just any regular text that's a field and if with that header still open or closed either way if I scroll down look at that it doesn't say number one it says two and that's because it's a field and word knows to update that value when it goes to the new page now I need to close my header I can either click this button or just double click in the active you know in the body because I want to make that active save that good work go back to my instructions that was step three so we're on to step four insert a manual page break before the second paragraph on the second page that begins with on behalf of the faculty and staff so let's change back to our document it said the second paragraph on the second page that begins with 
on behalf of faculty and staff. So I'm going to click before that because that is where the action is going to happen, is at my insertion point. How do we insert a hard page break? Control, enter. Move that down to another page. Never press enter, 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 enter. Never do that. Never do that. I can't see it because I have not displayed my hidden kit, my non printing characters. So I went ahead and displayed that. We're editing. Good idea to have those turned on. So let's see. Anything else we need to do? Looks good. Save that hard work. Back to the instructions. On to step five. Select all text that displays before the newly inserted paragraph break and double space the selected text. Remove any paragraph spacing from the selected text. Any paragraph spacing before or after. Okay. Now, it didn't say select all the text. It select, said select all text that displays before that newly inserted page break. So let's go back. Here's our document. In this case, it may be a good idea to zoom out. Oops, goodness, woo. Now that I've zoomed way out, look at all the pages that have been created. I now have a four page document. And I realize this is, is very small, but um, I hope I think you can select text and so I'm not worried about the details demonstrating that. What I want to show you is an efficiency, a, a fast technique. I can zoom out like this, click before the very first part of text. If I'm not sure if I'm at the top, how do I get to the top? Control home, right? So we use those techniques. And I'm going to hold my shift key down on my keyboard and keeping that shift key held down, they said to select all the text before the page break. I will just simply with my shift key still held down, click at the end of that. And I should see that it selected all that text. The, these keystrokes with the mouse, it's either going to be shift or control with the mouse button going to be very helpful. So um, with all that selected, I want to make sure that I double space. So I'm going to use this drop down box and I'm going to uh, use this two here to double space. Notice only the selected was affected. Okay. <clears throat> then I'm going to go back up here because they told me to remove all paragraph spacing. So this is kind of my shortcut way of saying remove space before. This is a fast setting. And I'm going to click that again and remove space after. Now did, did you see, um, can you see it shrinking up before the paragraph there? Uh, let me do this. How do I undo? Control Z. You see the space? Control Z again. That added the space before. You don't really see that a lot. How do I redo? Do you remember redo? Control Y, Control Y. Now, <clears throat> remember that I did go in under this setting to remove the space. Um, I do want to just double check it because it depends in this particular case how the, the My IT Lab grader uh, is going to check this. So under paragraph, if I use the paragraph launcher, um, Okay, this is what I wanted to check. In this paragraph dialog box, you notice here's the spacing. And it says that before is zero and after is zero. Um, for the purposes of my, tea, my lab IT grader checking this, may just want to double check that these values are not blank and that it actually has zero in there because I want you to get full points. If you're doing this in real life, of course, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is did the spacing change, right? So that's why I wanted to make sure you are aware of that shortcut and also how it can interact with the uh, greater grading process. So let's see, that looks good. Remove any paragraphs and save that great, great work and back to our instructions. That concluded step five. On to step six. Move to the beginning of the document and press enter. Remove the first line indent from the newly inserted blank paragraph. Uh, at the new paragraph, we're going to type the statement of purpose and apply bold formatting to the title. So that's really what we're doing, and we're going to center this title. So back to our work. 
And of course, I'm going to zoom back in because I really just want to, oops, what happened there? Cancel. Um, I really just want to see that one page. How do I get to the top? Control home. So here we are. Now, this is what they're talking about. First, as I look at this, I can see my header up here at the top with this page number um, that, that we chose. Um, I will say this, I'm a little concerned that I have two paragraph marks now that I look at that. I am not comfortable with that. I tell you what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to double click that header real quick and I'm going to delete this extra paragraph because I, I really just want the one paragraph and I believe the grader is going to want that as well. Okay, so I, I remove that. Now it's too close though, isn't it? Hmm. Okay, well, we'll see what the grader says. If it marks us wrong, we know what we need to change. Um, okay, so here I am up at the top, and I want you to take a moment and look at this ruler up here. Do you see these little three markers? Well, this first one has is called first line indent, and do you see that there is no tab character here? There are no spaces here, but instead the first line is indented, which is exactly what this is saying. Okay, what about the rest of those lines? The rest of those lines are flush with the margin. If I was creating something more like a, um, a, a dictionary where you see the word uh, normally kind of jutted out to the left and everything else, the description of that word indented, that is what's called a hanging indent, and that is, now you got to look very carefully at these two symbols because there's it's two symbols and I mean you got to get the little tippy top of that mouse pointed right into to me what looks like a home plate symbol and then if I clicked that nope it's got both of them I mean this is so hard to do folks they've made it harder with subsequent additions well I would have to get just that one Let's see if I even go up higher nope it is not gonna let me have that no, I just cannot get that. And probably what I'm doing is messing up my indent. Okay, let me control Z. Um, oh, goodness. There we go. I uh, needed to control Z to make sure I didn't make any accidental changes there. Okay, if I could select that, um, and, I, and I could go to the dialog box, uh, boxes as well in my paragraph, I could, uh, I could slide just this hanging indent. This third symbol, the square down here, moves them both. It keeps them locked in proportion to the distance, and it moves the, uh, the, the settings for the whole thing. So let me show you that. See how it's moving that consistently? Control Z, undo that. You also have one of those little symbols on the right side. You know how sometimes you see um, like a large quotation or something that you want offset, and you do want it indented from the left, but you also want a particular paragraph to be indented from the right? Look, see my text? See how that's happening? Okay, that's how you do that. So that's what these symbols are, therefore indents. Now here's why I show you that. When I click in this paragraph and I hit the enter key, I'm going to create a brand new paragraph. And how does this paragraph know how to be formatted? Where does it get those settings from? It copies them from the paragraph where your insertion point was. So this is going to be important not just now, but also as we progress into Excel. So with my insertion point in this paragraph, when I hit my Enter key, it copied, watch me click and move my insertion point back to this first paragraph. And that indent, that hanging indent, is already set because it copied it from this paragraph. Well, I don't want that because this is going to be my title up here at the top. So what I need to do is I need to take this hanging, this first line indent and I just need to slide it back over so that it's lined up. Okay. <clears throat> now my first line indent is still um, here and so they told me to type, uh, press enter, remove the first line indent from the newly inserted paragraph and we're going to type statement of purpose and they did ask us to bold this. I'm going to triple click. 
bold and they want me to center. I could have done it right there, but I'll just click center and there we are, All right? That was step six. Let's save that. Let's go back to our, oops, I'm sorry. Let's go back to our instructions on to step seven. In the second paragraph on the first page, place the insertion point after the period at the end of the sentence that ends with that. We're going to insert a footnote, and they tell us what to put in the footnote. So step seven, second paragraph, first page. Let's go there. We're on the first page. Let me scroll down. Second paragraph, I am looking for the sentence that ends, if I'm correct, with the university, yeah, by the University of Arizona. So there it is. And it tells me to click after the period because I am going to insert a footnote. So I'm clicking very precisely. If you're having trouble clicking, use your arrow keys to move that insertion point. Now, where are those footnotes and all those things that deal with sources and references? Reference. And here I can find my footnote. I'm going to insert that. Little number one corresponds to little number one. It's put the bar above the footnote, which is required. It's going to keep up with our numbering of those footnotes and dynamically adjust that as needed. So it says we're supposed to type the three minute thesis competition is open to all academic disciplines at the university. <clears throat> now, folks, you need to review your typing and make sure that you did not misspell or use improper capitalization. In the instructions, they told us to capitalize three minute thesis competition. That's a, a formal proper noun, so we need to capitalize that. The grader will mark you incorrect if you have spelling grammar, uh, probably, I'm sure, capitalization errors as well, okay? So you got to double check that. I have received emails in, you know, past uh, decades of teaching this where something is marked incorrect, you know, by an automated grader because there was a misspelling. And that's appropriate. That's appropriate. It needs to be spelled correctly. So let's see. That was step seven. Let's save that great work. Go back to our instructions. Rock and roll, folks. Here we go. Step eight. Modify the footnote text style, changing the font to Bookman Old Style and the font size to 12. We can do that. Not a problem. Here I am in my footnote. What am I going to do? Because I love to do it. Right click. <clears throat> I'm going to go to Style. Footnote uh, text is selected, and I'm going to click this Modify button. When I do, I'm just going to verify that I'm still in this footnote text, and here, they said I need to change this to um, Bookman Old Style, and it's got my most recently used fonts right there, so I don't have to look far, just pick that. And the value should be 12. That looks good. Click OK and apply. There we go. It changed that. That was step eight. Let's save that. Go back to our instructions. That was step eight. Step nine, find all occurrences of the word sophomore in the document and change the word to student. Now, you may terribly be thinking <clears throat> that you are just going to use your eyeballs and look for that word sophomore. Um, you may be successful, but you might miss one. So why don't we just let the computer do that? I'm going to start at the top of the document, so I'm going to press Control Home. And what am I going to do? <clears throat> Home tab. And I'm not just going to find, I'm going to replace. And they told me to look for the word sophomore. Right? And then I'm going to tab down to replace with. And they said I should replace this with student. Now, double check your spelling. Okay? And if you're a little nervous about this, then you could tell it to find that word and there it would find it and once I'm confident that you know it's selecting the right thing I could replace it and was there only one occurrence that's terrible that that uh, they said find all occurrences okay well I only found one occurrence I can double check replace all 
Well, it says there's zero replacements because I already replaced that. Close. Save. And that, let's double check, was step nine. Let's go back to the instructions. Step 10, we need to insert a footer, not a footnote, but a footer. And we're gonna select edit footer and we're gonna type uh, 2024 fall in the footer space and we're gonna change the font and we're gonna change the footer uh, font size and we're gonna close it. Now, they did not tell us left align, center align, right align. Uh, by default, it should be left aligned. So I assume we're gonna keep that. Now, this is nothing that's preset. So we're just gonna type it in. So I'm gonna go back to my document. And how do you think I open that footer? Well, I like to just scroll into this footer area. Now, I, this is, I like to show you this because remember, this footnote is in the active body of the document. It's not in the footer. So here's my uh, toolbar, right? And I would, I would be in this grayed out area and come into the paper to double click that. Folks, if you're not comfortable with doing that, this footer is going to be repeated on each page. And so why not, I could just go down here to this next page. I'm going to click to make it active so I can see my ruler. And here on this second page, I can maybe perhaps more easily see this inactive part, go across, double click, open my footer, or you know any of the other ways. But I want to make sure that I have my header and footer uh, ribbon that this is active. And they told me to type 2024 fall, 2024 fall. Now uh, I need to format this. So here's an interesting thing. I'm going to control A. I selected all within the container that I am in. If I'm not in the active document, then it's not going to select all that text. I am in the container of my footer. Notice that it did not select the header. It only selected within the footer container. So just again, little tips to help you uh, be a little bit more advanced. And within that, they said change this to uh, Bookman. And it is in my most recently used list and I'm going to also set the size to 12. There we go and you can see it there. Okay, um, I can go back here and close or double click in the active part. Verifying that good work is all done, let's save that. Go back to our instructions and that completed step 10 on to step 11. Select all text on pages four and five, right? But first, right? So select all text on pages four and five and format it in two columns. Insert a continuous section break before on behalf of the faculty and staff at the bottom of the fourth page. Okay, let's go over to our document. And it said pages four and five. So, you know, I can scroll down if I want. Um, since this is a five page document. I know that five is at the very end. I could control end and begin my selection there. If you want to zoom out as we did earlier, you can do that or I can click before on behalf of the faculty, right? So I'm going to select all this text. Now here's the thing. My insertion point is there. As I scroll now, I'm using the wheel on my mouse to scroll down. Um, notice that my insertion point is not moving. If I try to click anywhere or arrow, it's going to move my insertion point. If you are not using a, a separate mouse, then you may want to go over here to the scroll bar. See how the scroll bar does not change the location of the insertion point? So you can, if you're using a mouse pad on a laptop, for example, just come over and scroll, but you must scroll and make sure you're not moving that insertion point. Now we know here's the very end of our um, page five. So what is the key on the keyboard? Shift click and it should have selected all that text. And then I'm going to go to change up the layout of my document into two columns. The words, if you use them correctly, will guide you. So I am changing the layout, not the format, but the layout. And I'm going to go to columns. And they said to make that 
two columns. <clears throat> that looks a little strange, doesn't it? Now, I can see I'm in two columns, but that scared me at first, right? Because it looks like one column. But I can look up at the top. I can see this is two columns. Yeah, I've got two columns, just, you know, no more text, very limited text. But they did tell me to insert a continuous section break before the words on behalf of the faculty at the top of the fourth page. So here's what I'm looking for. See, on behalf of the faculty, I'm a little bit surprised. Here's that section break way up here. So um, I was surprised. I'm like, where is that se uh, section break? Because I know that this part of my document, let me zoom out so you can see. This is all kind of normal, you know, full page typing. Then it changes to the two columns. And in order for the layout to be inconsistent like that, I must have a section break. Okay, and so it inserted it above at the top page. But I'm not concerned about that because what I'm concerned with is despite that page break, I'm showing you both pages side by side, despite that, they told me to click on behalf of faculty and they told me to insert a page break or a continuous break. Now, that's okay. I can have you know, a lot of these continuous page breaks. Sometimes when you're doing a lot of editing, you do end up with those. So it's not going to, it's okay. It's not going to hurt anything. Let me go ahead and press that continuous. So I have this section break and I have this section. Are you wondering if that creates multiple sections? It, it does. It does. You know, so now I could potentially have three sections to my document. So I just need to be mindful of that. But again, when I have the non-printing characters displayed, I can see these, I can select them, I can delete them, you know, I can do whatever I need to do. So save that work, go back to my instructions, double check, we inserted, and top of the fourth page, that's the end of step 11. Let's go on to step 12. We didn't save that, did we? I'm starting to slip up here. I hope you're better than me. Make sure you're saving that work. Click before the newly inserted section break at the top of the fourth page and change the column to setting to one. In other words, a full page, one, one column, it, like normal, right? And then we're going to type a title. Uh, we're going to press enter twice and we're going to type some things. So let's go back to our document. See what they did there? They said click before that section break, change the layout so that it's one column. What paragraph were we in when we inserted that section break? We were in this one where there's two columns. So that section before that, in between this section break and this section break, it, was, it, it took the settings of this and made it two columns. They asked us to change it to one. Hmm, see, see it change right there? See it go all the way across? Now, they next told me to press enter uh, and type welcome to the College of Business. Oops, let me, let me spell <sighs> to the College of Business. And it says press enter twice. Oh, and I see I have an extra space. Let me make sure I delete that. And then they want us to select this text. And of course, I'm going to triple click uh, and apply the title style on the Home tab. There's my style. I'm going to pick that. It says reduce the font size to 22 and center the newsletter title. So they didn't say to modify the style. So I think now that I've applied that style and got those settings, I'm going to break with the style. I'm going to go ahead and do my own 22. And they did say to center, which would also be a little different than that style. So I'll center. Again, they did not tell us to update the style. I'm going to save that good work. Let's make sure we do that. <clears throat> go back to the instructions. End of step 12, already on to page 2. Give yourself a quick stretch and then get ready to continue on.
Lucky Step 13. It says add a bottom border with a weight of one and a half to the text, Welcome to the College of Business. So let's go back to our document. Welcome to the College of Business. That was the text that we just added. Now on this Home tab, as I look at my settings for the paragraph, you may notice there's this paint bucket and then there's this kind of four square. And what this is trying to show us is that if we had a table, then um, it would put a line wherever we can see this darker line, not the dotted. So this would put a, a line underneath. The, the only problem as I look at the instructions for step 13 is that it really is specific with saying that it needs to be a one and a half uh, weighted line. I don't know what the default is for that. I just can't remember. It may be one and a half or maybe just a half, frankly. Um, when I click on this drop down arrow next to the button, I can see that I could put a line above, you know, to the left, to the right, and sometimes with columns we do select text and put um, a border line. I can have no borders, but I'm going to go down here because I need to control these settings, and I'm going to pick borders and shading. Ah, okay. With borders and shadings, we are not using any of these preset settings over here on the side. What we know is that here we want the width to be, they said, one and a half. So see it right here? Now that I know this is what I want, and you may notice my style is already selected as the uh, solid line. I, so I didn't need to select the style, I, you, know, you can click it or change the style if needed, you could change the color, I needed to change the width. Now I'm going to use this dialog box here in the middle, because what this says is if you had a table or a cell, like a row column intersection, a cell selected, where do you want the line? Do you want it at the top? Nah, I don't want that. Do I want it on the left? Nah. Do I want it on the right? And I could select as many of these as I want. The only one I want is across the bottom. Okay, so that's how I want to apply this set, these settings. Okay, there it is. I'm gonna click away to make sure you can see it. You see that line? And we made it a little heavier than the traditional line. All right, looks good. So that was Lucky Step 13. Let's save that in case we are unlucky and, and we don't wanna lose our work. Let's go back to our instructions. Step 14, place the insertion point before that title at the beginning of the second body paragraph. Oh, okay, so this is text that's in the second body paragraph of the fourth page. Uh, and then we're gonna insert a picture, okay. And we're gonna do some formatting to that. Okay, so let's go back and we're headed for page four <clears throat> oh, which we're already on. Now, because I'm going to start working with this, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see that page better. And uh, on page four, let me just make sure it said place the insertion point before the College of Business at the beginning of the second. There we are. Click right here before the second body paragraph, College of Business and insert, and so now I'm getting ready to insert a picture, so let's think for a minute, where is that picture? I saved it in a folder on my desktop, um, you know, the, and the folder was named Capstone, so that's where I'm going for this. So insert, picture, this looks a little different in older versions of Word. I'm gonna say, where is that picture? This picture is on this device. It is not a stock, I'm sorry, let me move this. It's not a stock image. It's not an online picture, which is also kind of a stock image. Um, it's this device. I need to navigate to my desktop, which is where I saved the files in the Word capstone. There's my picture, insert. So with my picture inserted, I wanna make sure that you know, it's selected. Um, if it's not selected, you can click on it. What you're looking for is this picture format ribbon up here at the top. That's gonna give me all the tools that apply specifically to this picture. I am looking at picture styles and they are telling me that I need to select, what do they want? The reflected rounded rectangle. So when I hover over these, 
um, it <clears throat> I haven't clicked anything I'm just hovering my mouse it previews what that effect is but it also displays the name now see that's drop shadow rectangle I'm looking for reflected rounded rectangle so this is it click isn't that kind of cool that looks like you paid some big money to do that right or you really know some computer stuff so it looks good we like it now we're not done yet now, just a little bit more to do. It says resize the picture uh, height to one inch and select square text wrapping. So still on my picture format ribbon down here to the side. Now, pictures uh, by default have the aspect ratio locked, or they should, so that when I adjust either the height or the width, the other one changes to be proportional. They said to uh, change the height to one and just type 1. Now right now width is at 2.5 when I press enter to keep that picture proportional so it doesn't look like it was stretched out strangely um, it kept the width at 1.5. Now the final step to this instruction is it says we need to adjust text wrapping so that's this button and they wanted us to choose square which is this one and what did that do? Let me move that away. And you can see that it brought the text up next to the picture. It's, it's square with, with the picture. Okay, that looks good. Let's save that good work. Let's go back to our instructions. That was step 14. On to step 15. Place the insertion point after the period, ending the first paragraph on the second page. In other words, um, after the period in upon graduation. We're going to press enter. We're going to remove the first line indent, insert a second column. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, insert a two column by six row table. And we're going to change the width of the second column. I mean, we've got it going on here. Oh, here goes this table. So back to our document. They said that we need to go to the second page. Are we on the second? Nope, we're on the fourth page. Let's go up here. We need to go to second page. And for this uh, first paragraph. So here's the first paragraph on the second page, ending with upon graduation. So here it is. Click after the period, they said. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it said uh, press the Enter key. I'm going to scroll up so that you can see. I pressed the Enter key. It inserted a new paragraph, copying the settings of the paragraph where my insertion point was. And so with my uh, you know, insertion point here, I'm going to remove this first line indent. Just going to drag that back over. And I'm going to insert a table and they said that this table should be two columns and six rows oops there okay so that's what it should look like I'm gonna click there's my table and it said change the width of the second column so I'm gonna select all the cells in this column and it said change this the width of the second column to one inch uh, now I could drag, but they really are asking me to be pretty precise here, so I'm going to right click on that selection. I'm going to go to Table Properties. Now I'm currently on the Table tab. I'm going to move over to the Column tab, and it says what is the preferred width, and notice right now it says 2.75. Uh, yours perhaps could be different. Um, I can just select that, and I'm going to, they said 1, and I'm going to press Enter. And that is one inch. So now I'm very precise on that. That was step 15. Let's save that. Go back to the instructions. Step 16. Type course in the top left cell and press tab. Type grade in the next column and press tab. That's how we're moving tab from each, um, each cell. And then we're going to fill in this information. So I'm going to do that. You can work along with me, um, but following these instructions.
With that complete, I'm going to just review my work, making sure there's no typos, and making sure that my, you know, typing of this exactly reflects the their spelling, you know, INT period, capital M, uh, capital grades here, everything looks exactly like they want it because I don't want to lose points with the graders. With that, I'm going to save my good work, go back to the instructions. That was step 16. On to step 17. Insert a row above the first table, the, above the first row in the table, and merge those cells because it looks like we're going to put a title, and we want that title to stay with the table. So we're going to put that, we're going to center that, and we're going to make our table pretty. We're going to apply a style, and then we're going to center the entire table. So let's do that. I'm going to select this row. Now, my pop-up bar came up. Look at this. It says insert below. I don't want that. It said insert above. If you did not get this menu, then just simply right-click and go to insert rows. Just you know, multiple ways to do this. And it said I should select this because I want to merge those cells. Now, again, as I drug over this, you can see that right here I could quickly go to merge cells just to make sure that everybody is capable of following along because sometimes, you know, you can see that it went away. You could just reselect it, um, but I'm going to go to layout because I can also find these menu settings here. Then I'm going to type the title, which they say is Major Courses Completed. They want us now, listen to this instruction. They want us to al apply Align Center Alignment. They did not say Apply Center Alignment because Center Alignment would simply be one-dimensional. We're in a table, so we really have to pay attention to what's being requested. And they wanted us to center center. So they call that align center. So they said apply align center alignment. OK, clicking there. Now, what that did, it may not look like it. And that's because of the spacing after um, our text but um, you know like paragraph spacing but it is two-dimensionally centered be careful about that because if you chose incorrectly it may look the same at this point if you just did the one-dimensional center align but the grader is going to mark it wrong you're going to say I don't see any difference but the grader can see the coding behind the scenes that where you did not pick the correct alignment okay so make sure that you've got that um, with that Let's see, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to apply a table style. Now, I need to apply this to the whole table. I'm going to select the table, and I like to do that by just clicking the handle here, okay? With that, this is a table design, and this is where I'm going to see my styles, and the style they want is grid table 4. So let me expand that. I'm looking in this category, grid tables, and they want grid table 4, which is, um, let's see, let's look at this, 1, that's still 1, they want grid table 4. Now, for me, notice that when I go too far over this way, now it's grid table 2. For you, that may be the second row. In the instructions, they say, go to row 4, column 7, but for me, that's different because this is row 1, this is row 2, this is row 3. This is row four. That's, folks, that's not how we do rows, is it? But can you even see that they're trying to tell you that they didn't even really wrap them, which would have made sense, like make this one, two, three, four, and then make this one five. Instead, they went across. But because they're not exactly at the same height, I don't know, got to really pay attention is kind of the moral to the story. So for me, make sure I'm reading these little uh, notes that pop up, and when they it says grid table four. Okay, so that's this. And they want accent six. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so for me, it's, it's way over here. It's kind of a reddish color, but I need to make sure I read where it says grid table four, accent six, select. 
beautiful bolded these labels over here made this look so pretty with a white text on a deep rich red background looks beautiful all my grades are really standing out here okay final step <clears throat> I need to make sure my table is still selected if not click that handle and this is where we're going to align the entire table as an object we're going to move it to the middle of the page horizontally okay so that's where we would use this one save save that great great work let's go back to the instructions step 18 already here we go <clears throat> add a caption below the table the caption should read and they give us the text uh, do not include the period it says and we should center the caption okay let's go back to our document with my table selected um, I want to look up across the top now I know I have a table design and table layout uh, tab but in this case the instructions are telling us to add um, a, a caption and in the caption and you hint hint know this from the quiz right this is often where we um, label or title or even give a citation sometimes to our work where did this data come from so because we sometimes uh, put citations in here we're gonna find this under references maybe a little different than what you were thinking so it's under references and as I look across here now be really careful here I'm not actually adding a citation I am inserting a caption so my table is selected I'm clicking insert caption I have a few options here let's see they want me to type a colon so it says table one I need to type colon that's the two dots so I need to shift to get to that then I'm gonna put a space and then I'm going to type I did not type the period at the end which, and the instructions tell me not to but I do want to double check and I can use my arrow keys to move that insertion point and ultimately kind of keep scrolling so I can double check that I have spelled and capitalized exactly as the instructions require now they do tell me that they want this below so let's make sure that we change this goes below all these other look okay let's click okay now see my table caption and it's by default aligned to the left I need to go to the home tab and again this is uh, based on the document so I'm just centering in one dimension double check it looks good save if I do see a typo or you know a poor capitalization I could fix that here okay so that looks good let's go back to the instructions and we just completed step 18 we're moving on to step 19 we're going to create a custom a custom watermark to display at a diagonal with the text copy in blue uh, it says column 8 in standard colors okay so let's go back to our document did I save this let's make sure we save that and we're going to make a watermark so across the top design tab I'm going to go over here to watermark now listen you know look at at these presets because they're really great right I just want to remind you of those but they're instructing us to make a custom watermark and it says do you want a picture uh, and that would be cool right we could put a picture in the background or do we want text well we're gonna type and the text that they told us to type was just simply copy all caps oh no uh, capital C the rest is lowercase uh, they only told us that it should be in blue so my color here they said column 8 in standard colors uh, down here at the bottom blue standard color click that was that it all right click OK you see it and it's it's behind the text it's behind the table if I zoom out I see that that's on every uh, page I can still read the text but um, 
I don't know. I want people to know this is not the original, that this is a, a copy, I guess. So now they know. Let's save that. And that was step 19, so let's go back to the instructions. On to step 20. Check that spelling and grammar. We know that. We're going to correct the misspelling of the word analyzed and the hyphenation of first time. If the check does not suggest a change for first time, manually correct it in the second to last paragraph in the left column, changing first time so that it is hyphenated. Okay, ignore all other uh, grammatical and cl uh, clarity concerns. So let's go to our document. You know I like to uh, go to the very top, Control Home. I'm also going to zoom back out so that we can see the text. I mean, that's maybe too much. Okay, so I'm at I'm on page one. I'm up here at the top, and you know. I, Two ways you can do this. If I, I can, just go home because we do this so frequently. Here it is, down here at the end. Otherwise, we know it's something we do when we review, final review, so you could go under the Review tab. Editor, it's already checked. Okay, now I see it has only found one spelling error. Okay, I'm going to go to that, and that's analyzed, and of course they told us to correct that. But they do want us to fix what they, they're they telling us is a spelling error, which is the first time should be hyphenated. So I am going to use my replace button. I'm going to type first space time. If you want to search and try to find it in the document, uh, knock yourself out. Uh, first hyphen time. Now, I don't know, that might be in there multiple times, but I'm so I'm just going to be very cautious. I'm going to click Find Next. Here it is, and does that agree with my instructions? Where it's on step 20, it says on page 5. Yep, page 5 uh, in that paragraph. So, yeah, do I want to replace that? Yes. And that was it. So, yep, use the tools. Use the tools. Be really accurate. I'm going to save that. That way you learn them uh, in much more much better. Okay, so that was step 20. Let's, it looks good. Save that work. Go back to the instructions. Step 21, replace the dash dividing the words organization and fortune 500 in the first paragraph on the fourth page with an M dash symbol in the same paragraph, replacing the dash following the words restaurant, uh, restaurants with an M dash symbol. Okay. Um, here's, I, I want to show you something. I, I've got these instructions open. I'm just going to open a new blank document. And I'm going to zoom in pretty big here because I really want you to see this. Now, when I type letters of a certain font, um, let's say I type, my dog has fleas. Can I spell that correctly? Okay. And I, I just put some space there. I hit that paragraph uh, symbol. Um, when I, you know, select this text and I change the, the font, look how the letters even change and the spaces change. The spaces between, like, the space between dog and has um, is, is much bigger than than this. It's part of the font. Also, if I, I'm going to type this one more time. Oh, I, I dog has, I, I've said, I was like, why is that telling me it's a, <laughs> we're just having fun. Okay. I hope my dog does not have fleas. That would be bad. Um, okay. Now, also, when I, I look at at these letters, and in fact, I need this to say my, if I change the font, now notice that this is Calibri 11 and this is currently Calibri 11, but if I select this and I change this to a font that is a bigger font, not all fonts are the same, not all letters are the same. Um, and so I'm going to pick a font that is kind of a big font like, um, how about Arial is kind of a big font. Now. These are both 11 points, but look at the M here. That M, if you can see that, is actually bigger than this one. You can even 
perhaps go, uh, show that more. Let me change this one to uh, Times New Roman. Oh, actually that looks a little similar, doesn't it? Um, but it really is important to understand that the font as well as the size affects things like spaces. It affects the, you know, the width, not just the height, but the width of the letter. So why do I explain all this? Um, because if I put my dog has fleas, let me turn this off. I'm going to put a space and I'm just going to put a hyphen, right? Hyphen. Uh, does yours? Right? Look at the size of that hyphen. My dog has fleas, hyphen does yours and I'm going to type that again the size of that hyphen can be, oh and it it changed my hyphen oh it's auto correcting and that's given me a little grief here um, because it changed it to a dash and a dash is actually bigger than a hyphen but how big I'm so sorry it did that and I didn't catch it because it was so large um, how big should that be if we are talking about uh, an M dash, it is the size of the letter M. If we are talking about, sometimes you'll hear about an N dash, dash, it is the size of the letter N. Okay, those letters are not the same width. On a typewriter, they would be. And there are certain fonts where you can make them. But as you adjust the font, as you adjust the size, the size of that dash can change. And what we are saying is make that dash the same size as a letter M or the same size as a letter N, which would be smaller and would not necessarily be the same size. Because both of these would probably be bigger than a hyphen. Okay? So little descriptive background of what we're talking about with that. So they are telling us in step number 21 to replace that dash that's dividing the word organization and Fortune 500 in the first paragraph on the fourth page with an M dash symbol. Let's start there. Let me go back. Let me go, it says to the uh, fourth page, right? First paragraph, fourth page. And here's Fortune 500. And if you can see that, there is that little, little, little dash. Now, I selected it. Because I have it selected, if I type, if I insert something, it will delete and replace it with whatever I'm inserting. So under Insert, I'm going to go to Symbol. I'm going to go to More Symbols. From here, I'm going to select Special Characters. Here's where you can see, and here you can see the size difference. Look at this. This is an M dash, the size of the letter M. This is an N dash, the size of the letter N, as compared to a hyphen. Now, this one happens to say a non-breaking hyphen. In other words, I do not want it to wrap and to separate the hyphenated words, right? So it's still a hyphen, and, and so, you know, that's... That's the difference. Now, there's an M. Uh, this is an M space. It would be the space the size of a letter M, or the space the size of a letter, the letter N, or kind of, a, look at that. I mean, all these different options. That can be very important. I have the, the one selected, this very first one. There's keystrokes for it. If this is something I do a lot, I may want to learn those keystrokes. Just going to click Insert. Now, you didn't necessarily see if your box was over here. You may not have noticed that something did happen. I'm going to move this. Look how much bigger that is. That is an M dash. So I'm going to close that. Okay. It changed it right there. Now that was not the only step. They say in the same paragraph, replace the dash following the word restaurants with an M dash dash symbol. So where is that um, same paragraph here? Little bitty hyphen. 
I have it selected, which means that when I insert something, it's going to delete that and replace it with whatever I've selected. Symbol, more symbols, special characters, M dash, watch, watch that, insert. There it is. Much bigger. Close. Looks good. Save that. Let's go back to the instructions. Just confirming we did all steps for 21. On to step 22. Select the paragraph beginning with, I hope you accept the challenge on the last page. It says make sure you include the paragraph mark. And apply shading of red, accent 6. Woo, okay. Uh, lighter, 60%. And let's see, to the selected paragraph. This must be an important paragraph, okay? So let's go back to our document. I'm going to go to the last page. So that's here. I hope you will accept the challenge. And it said select the paragraph and make sure that I get the uh, paragraph mark. I'm going to triple click. It selected the whole paragraph and double checking it did get the paragraph mark so I'm gonna apply some shading that's on the home tab shading is my paint bucket this shades it fills in as it's as if you are pouring paint into the entire paragraph and I want this is that's like a purpley this is red it's accent six but I want it 60% that's 40 that's 25, that's 60, okay? So it's this one here, click. Wow, that is some red. Now, I do want you to notice one thing. When we poured the paint bucket into this paragraph of text, it made it so that the, the paragraph is no longer transparent. I can't see through the text to whatever is behind it. So <clears throat> it's not transparent anymore, and so I cannot see all of the word copy. Not necessarily a problem, but I do just want you to get a little bit of uh, insight into whether something is transparent. In other words, can I see through it, or, or I can't. And in this case, because I shaded it, I poured my paint bucket into it, it's no longer transparent. That's fine. There's one other thing I'll point out as a practical business skill. Um, oftentimes, we are putting documents on a copier, you know, giving handouts so that we can have it present in the meeting. And if we did, this could become problematic. On a typical black and white copier, this may come out to be nothing but a very dark block that's there's not enough contrast between the text and the shading for us to read. So be mindful of that in a digital environment or if you are fortunate enough to have color printers where you work and color copiers as kind of a default, then it might be okay. But if I'm working with people and I don't know that they are going to be working always digitally, I don't know if they are going to um, have that equipment, I'm not going to send them something with, with no concept. Uh, contrast. A much better alternative, if you really want to highlight something like this, <clears throat> is to make the shading black and the text white. If it's on automatic, and we've discussed that automatic setting before, the text should automatically change. Just for demonstration purposes, let me do that. I'm going to go to black. Look at that. If I wanted to capture your uh, attention, that would be great. And if you photocopied it, put it on the copier, no problem. It's still going to be clear and crisp. Okay. Now, the black may be a little faded because it takes a lot of toner, but you're going to get that contrast. I don't want that. I need to follow the instructions. Control Z. Undo. Save that. That was step 22. Let's go back. Double check. We finished all that. On to step 23. Let me scroll up because, goodness, we're getting to the bottom of that second page. Yay! Click the References tab and ensure that the writing style is MLA. Place the insertion point and do, we're going to insert some things. Let's get to it. Let's go back to our instructions, or I'm sorry, to our document. And we're going to References. I'm seeing if we're supposed to click any place. And we're going to put this as MLA. There it is. 
We know that's something with references and sources, right? MLA placed the insertion point after the words 600 graduate students before the ending punctuation mark at the end of the first sentence in the right column on page four. So I need to go up. Here we go. Okay, so here I am. There's the title for, for reference. Here's 600 graduates, and it said, place the insertion point after the words 600 graduate students and before the ending punctuation mark at the end of the first and insert a citation in a new source uh, to a new source selecting and we're going to enter this new source okay no problem insert we're going to add a source and I'm just going to fill in the information in our instruction so the type of source I'm going to set that first is report now I'm going to fill in based on the instructions. Now this is a corporate author. Make sure I select that. Look at that. It moved the author information down to that. You know, that can be very important because it would then belong to the uh, university. Double check your information, punct you know, capitalization, make sure everything is in the correct field. Sometimes to keep your hands on the keyboard, you can use the tab key. Uh, they gave us the information a little bit out of order, but that's okay. Click OK once you've verified. There's our citation that it inserted. Let's make sure we save that good work and go back to our instructions because we're going on to page three, which means we're almost done. Woohoo! All right, here we go. Begin a mail merge. Mail merge. You'll love these. You'll use these all the time. It says begin a mail merge based on letters. And so what they're describing here, let me go to my document, back to the document, is we're, we're doing a mail merge. And so that's something that is under mailings. And they're saying that we should base it on letters. So if I say start mail merge, this is what they're referring to, okay? Based on it's not going to be an email, it's not going to be a label or an envelope, and so that's going to affect the formatting. So I'm going to start a mail merge based on letters. Go back to my instructions here. Page three, woohoo! It says select uh, the recipients. So remember, we're just marching right across this list here select recipients. We're going to use an existing list. Where did we save our files? I put mine on the desktop and I put them in the Word capstone folder and here is that existing list graduate schools and I'm going to click on open. Here's sheet one. We're going to learn more about that in our next chapter. Um, look at that. By default, it says first row of data contains column headers. That's true. We're going to click OK. Now, we're going to filter that list. So in order to filter it, I need to edit. Here's my list. And it said I want to filter for the area equal to W. So you see what I did? I clicked that drop-down box. And this is a, a filtering technique, and I can just click that. So only two, but that's okay. You know, I'm letting the computer figure that out. Maybe it was three, maybe it was seven. Maybe two got deleted and one got added, right? I'm letting the computer do that work. Okay. Now, I can double check that. Up here, if I say, go to the very last record, only two records, so I can verify that this has been filtered. <clears throat> that was all of step 24. We still have a little bit more to do, not much. Let's click on save. Let's go back to our instructions. Step 25. 
replace the university name in the first paragraph on the third page with the merge field university. Uh, be sure to include the brackets with the text to be replaced. Ensure that a space proceeds and follows the newly inserted university placeholder and then preview the results and then finish the merge, choosing to edit individual documents and, all mer and merging all records. Okay, so let's go back and we need to go to the first paragraph on the third page. Here it is. Now do you see where they have made a little note to themselves, right, that this is the university name. So I'm going to select that, including the brackets, uh, because what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to delete this and, and, and insert the mail merge field. Now if you're having trouble selecting you can use your delete key you can use shift and the arrow hold the shift key down while you use your arrows I've selected it here across the top let's just quickly recap we started a mail merge using the letter format we selected an existing list we edited that list to filter now we're continuing across and in your greater chapter projects, you use the address block and the greeting line. This time we're going specifically to a merge field. So I click that little drop down box and they told us to pick university. And this I can tell now, I just clicked one time, I didn't select. And it's a field. What do we know about fields? We know that Word is gonna look to the database that it has. In this case, it has this Excel spreadsheet and it's going to pull the information and change it as necessary for each document. So we're set up now. Now we need to finish that merge. Before we finish it, I'm sorry, let me keep marching over. It told us to preview our results. That's this button here. Look how it even expands so that the text wraps. This is where good technique is going to be important, right? make sure this uh, editing is smooth. That's my first record. That's my second record. See how it changed? If I want to return and view only the field. So however I want to do that, I'm going to go back where I just see the field. And it's telling me to finish and merge the results. Now, what's going to happen when I do that is I have this document right now, but it's going to open a new document with the merged results. So this is our source document, or some people call it the main document, and we're going to finish this into a separate document that contains both of these records, right? So I currently have five pages. When I create this new document, there's going to be one copy of those five pages for University of Sa uh, Southern California. That's going to be the second one and one for University of Northern Colorado. Okay, So I'm going to save this because I want to keep this you know, as I continue with my merge. I'm going to finish and it says don't send them to the printer, don't send them to email, edit the individual documents and so I'm going to click that. It said all records which is going to be the two because we filtered the records. Did you see it opened another document? It's calling it letters one. And <clears throat> how many pages is it? It's 10. And we expect that. If we got 50 or if we got three pages or something, you know, we would know this is uh, would be a problem. So it looks good, looks good. Look at that university, Northern Colorado. Not a field because this is the, the result of after the merge has happened. Scroll down. There's our document. It's looking good, isn't it? <clears throat> now, I will give you the same warning that I gave you when we did this in the Grader project, um, which is if I have made a mistake, okay, and I'm just showing you here that this is University of Southern California, right? If I have made a mistake in the source document, the, what we called the main document. That mistake would be repeated here in this resulting document. So if my lab IT gives you an error on something related to this merge, you need to not just edit it within this, you need to go back 
probably all the way to step 24, okay? Reverse out those steps uh, to, to make that change, or if, you, if it's just a little you know, spelling error or something, you need to make sure that you're making it in the main document as well as in this, these two copies that are in this letters document. Now, it does not instruct us to save the letters document, but I'm going to simply because I want to keep it in case I did make a mistake and I might need to make some changes. So I'm just going to pause for a minute while I do that. So the document is saved. Let's go ahead and go back to the instructions. And again, that's just something I felt comfortable doing because I wanted to save it. So we finished, oh, we finished which one? Step 24. And we finished step 25, and now we're on to step 26. Now it says in step 26 <clears throat> to select the entire 10 page merged document and copy it. As you know from the chapter grader on this, we can only submit one file uh, into My Lab IT for grading. So what they're having us do may seem a little nonsensical, but it's for purposes of grading. They're having us take this second letters document that we just produced. You didn't need to save it. And they're having us copy everything out of it, and they're going to have us insert it into that file that we're going to upload for grading. So this, you know, in, into the main document. Under normal circumstances, you would never take those individual product documents and put them back into your main document. That is probably confusing to you. In the real world, you would not do that. You are only doing it so that you can submit this into the grader and have it graded. Okay, So they're even telling us here, move the insertion point to the end, insert a manual page break. This is very similar to the chapter grader where we did mail merge. And at the top of the document to paste that copied text. The original document to which you pasted it um, now should contain 15 pages. Right? Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to that letters document. <clears throat> Excuse me, it should be called letters one. This, just to verify, is our 10 page document. So I'm going to click anywhere in that 10 page document to select everything, Control A, right? To copy, we're already on the keyboard, so how about Control C? Just press that one time and it copies you don't see anything visible that just happened, but control C copies everything into the memory of the computer. So it's waiting out there for you to paste it. Well, where do we paste it? Let's go back to the document that begins with our last name. And they told us to go to the end of the document. So we, of course, are going to control end. Look at that, see how I'm at the <clears throat> the very end of the document. Um, when I get to the end of the document, it says insert a manual page break, control enter. So now I'm at the top of page six. And you know, it's a little strange because we're still in two columns here. Um, I would be tempted to go ahead, even if the document is going to change this, and put a continuous page break. But they did not tell us to do that. They just said to paste. How do we paste? Control V, as in victory, Control V is paste. Now that we've pasted, let's look at our page count. 15 pages. That looks pretty good. It says save the document. And it says you can close all other documents without saving. What they are saying is that it is not necessary for you to save this letters, but that you do not need it anymore so that you can close it. <clears throat> Let's go back to our final instruction. Step number 27, save and close, exit Word, submit the file as directed. What's the golden rule? Close everything in Word, just like they are telling. Oh, did I not save that? Oh my gosh, make sure you have saved that original document, you know, the one that begins with your last name. If you get prompted like this, do you want to keep the last item that you copied? Remember when we copied all that stuff, it put it up in the memory of the computer. It's floating up here on what they call a clipboard. It's an imaginary clipboard. Will I need that? 
No, I don't need to save that. It's just going to take up memory if you uh, say that you're going to use it, uh, uh, you know, more. We'll copy it again if we need it again. Okay, closed everything. Back to my original. Now I'm going to log into my lab IT, or if the if at this point uh, we have embedded uh, this information into Pause, then you're going to have different steps for submitting from within Pause, and you'll use those. So I've logged in to my lab IT, my IT lab, however you want to call it, and I've gone to Course Materials and I've opened up the, this cap. And I want to point out something that is hugely important. This capstone consists of two parts. There is a quiz, but you cannot access the quiz. It will not show you the quiz until you pass the grader with a 70% or more. Okay, hugely important. There are two parts. A common mistake is that students just submit the grader and they're not listening to this instruction, which is in the syllabus. Uh, you know, it's been explained here in the video, of course. And so if you're listening and you're paying attention to this, I appreciate and the benefit to you for doing that is that you're not going to miss out on something really important. So good for you. I appreciate you. Let's click on this. Now we'll start to see. Okay, here's the grader, and here is this grayed out not available quiz. It's not available yet because I have not submitted the grader. Now, here's a reason I really want to do well on this grader. Notice that at the end it says it's a badging activity. If I can score a 90% or above, I'm going to get an email from Pearson with a badge that I can display on social media. This might be especially valuable <clears throat> if you put your resume out there online. You can display this Pearson badge that says, hey, I learned this material. This is something, this is evidence of my good score, right? Evidence of your learning in our class. So let's continue. This first grader is going to operate like all the other graders, this, this first step. I want to say first grader, I meant first step. So I'm going to click that. Of course, I don't need to download materials. You know, I'm going to choose the file. I'm ready to submit. For me, it's on the desktop. Folks, double check. Where did you put it? Where is that file? Is this the capstone? Make sure you're not trying to submit the you know, chapter four, chapter three, uh, you've done all this work, make sure you are submitting the file where you actually did the work. If you have multiple copies, that is commonly the source of frustration. Select that, click OK. Not done yet, upload. Here comes success, success. Let's submit for grading, our fingers are crossed. Giving it a minute. It's pending. It's thinking. Now, if I want, I can refresh this page. The keystroke to refresh, by the way, is the F5 key along the top of your keyboard. That would keep you on this page, which could be important. <clears throat> if, if instead I want to go to the three dots and view submissions, 94 percent now, I do remember I made some changes, like to the header. Maybe I was wrong. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to view what's going on here. Oh, made a couple mistakes. Okay, let's see. Okay, insert a header that includes a left line page number and close the header. And you know what? I deleted that extra paragraph, and I bet that I shouldn't have. Page numbers was not detected at the top of the page. Hmm. Text alignment was not set to left. Well, that was the default. Okay, might have to look at that. Now I'm still okay because I'm in this 90, you know, what is it, 94%, 94%. So <clears throat> in terms of points, I'm okay. But, I, you know, I want to see if I can do a little better. Up here it says move to the beginning of the document. 
and press enter, remove the first line indent from the newly inserted uh, at the top of the paragraph type statement of purpose and apply bold. So it looks like I probably forgot a step. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to close this. And what I want to show you is that my status is passed. Look at your syllabus because in terms of points for our class, what does that mean? What does this mean in terms of earning a badge? Right? Okay. <clears throat> now, now that I have reached the status of pass, now I need to take the quiz. Now, I'm not giving you the answers to the quiz, okay? I want you to go in and I want you to complete that quiz because you need to make sure that you earn those points. I'm just clicking this to open the quiz, okay? But the point is, and now I'm going to close that, the point is that this quiz was, oh, I'll tell you, I'm going to save for later. How about that? The point is that this quiz was not available to me until I first not just submitted, I had to pass this grader. Up until then, this grader is just a regular grader. The quiz is a regular quiz, but the quiz is not available to you until you score a passing status, right? 70% or, or above. You want 100%, you definitely want 90% or above because you want that badge. Now, let's see if we can't fix a couple of the um, items here. I'm going to go back into my document. Now, remember, I've also done a mail merge in this document, so it starts to get a little more complicated. Oh, this is great that this has come up. We haven't addressed this yet. It says that I'm opening this document, and it says opening this document will run the following SQL command. This is what it's telling us. It's saying I'm connected to that Excel spreadsheet. Right, because we're opening our source or our main document. So it, that connection still exists. It's just warning us so that we know, do we want to continue? Yes, we do. All right, the first problem was up here with the uh, page number. And that was what, step five. Select all the text that displays uh, before the newly inserted page. Oh, Let's, maybe I can try a different one. Here's page. Here's top. Um, I went with the plane. It could just be that I forgot to, um, didn't forget, but that I assumed that the default uh, of left align was sufficient, but maybe they actually want me to click that. All these others just look a little too fancy. Um, I'm going to click that again, and I do have two paragraph marks, and I'm going to leave that this time. Um, just as also, look at that, it selected that. Why did it do that? Um, oh, because of the anchor. Okay, so I'm going to click there, make sure that's left aligned. It is. Oh, let's have left align. I'm going to click this, and it, it says it's left aligned. When I click it, it's moving it to justified. I don't want that. I'm going back to left. So I don't know. I'm clicking it just to make sure. I'm double clicking to get out of the header and I'm going to save that. Um, statement of purpose. Statement of purpose. That's what it's supposed to be. I'm going to find a state of purpose. Well, I didn't even capitalize that right. And it's supposed to be statement. Do you see how this is now on page six? Because I have this in so many places. Where else is it? There it is again on page 11. Did I fix this in all the relevant? Close that. I've got statement of purpose now. I no longer have state of purpose. Um, hopefully, oh, look at my headers. Now, because we have separate um, sections within the document, <clears throat> the headers do not necessarily remain the same. If I change the header in one section, it does not by default change the header in the other section. So this is kind of a good thing to see. Let me go into that header. Let me go ahead and change that page number. And you know, we saw before that it is left aligned. I think my error here was that I should not have deleted that uh, paragraph. So that's okay. But which section did I change this in? And this is where, 
you know, having so many copies of this, let, I'm going to go, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to go control end. So I'm on page 15 and I'm checking this. I'm scrolling up, look at this, this section is not, uh, well, okay, that section is probably okay there. It's got both paragraph marks, okay. Let me keep scrolling up. This one looks okay. Now I feel like all my headers are at least as good as I can understand the directions to be. So now I'm going to uh, have a save this, close this. I corrected my poor spelling state of purpose rather than statement of purpose. Uh, I'll try to mark that on the video, but hopefully you will do better than me. And I'm going to click this grader again. Let me choose my file. <sighs> Fingers are crossed. Not done yet. Upload. Looking for success of the upload. Now, big time fingers crossed. Submit for grading. <sighs> hmm. Okay. What's... What's, what's going on here? Still only shows one attempt, so I'm not sure. Uh, remember, only your highest score is going to be recorded, so there's no penalty for resubmitting for our class. Well, I'm much better now. I, I have a 98.5% now that that second attempt has been graded. Still have a little error that I need to work on. It looks like I'm having a problem with that header. It's driving me crazy now. Hopefully you can see it and you can tell me. And thank you so much, folks. I appreciate you and I hope you have earned that badge uh, and learned a lot as we conclude Word. Final reminder, do that quiz, folks. Do that quiz. Don't forget. Thanks. Bye.